Well, I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and I trained at Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital Boston, where I became interested in neutrophils. So I've been studying them for over 30 years and have become involved with the Severe Chronic Neutropenia International Registry and the National Neutropenia Network through that work. Okay. Neutrophils are made at a very rapid rate, um, several hundred billion a day, from bone marrow precursors that mature, divide, and then are released from the bone marrow into the blood. They only live a few hours, possibly four to six hours in the blood, and then enter tissue where they probably only live another few hours, but that um, time scale is not well known. They are the rapid responders of the immune system, which means that when there is a organism that tries to invade the body or any kind of insult, they are the ones that rush to the scene, and they're there within minutes. They exit the circulation, go into tissue, and eat organisms. They're called phagocytes, which is from the Greek for the word to eat, and then they kill them. So when neutrophils are absent, uh, the body is susceptible to infections by bacteria and fungi. They are not involved in defense against viruses, so even without any neutrophils, viral um, immunity is perfectly normal. The usual measure of neutrophil number is called the absolute neutrophil count. The standard blood test that you see is a white blood cell count, and then a differential blood count determines the percentage of each type of blood cell, of white blood cell. There are neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes, and then a couple of other rarer cells, eosinophils and basophils. Just to make matters more complicated, neutrophils are called by several different names, and different laboratories will use different names for them such as poly, or polymorphonuclear leukocyte, seg, which means segmented neutrophil, and band, which is a band form of neutrophil. But in any case, you take the percentage of those cells, which may be either the neutrophil percent or the sum of the seg and the band percent, if they're broken down that way, and multiply that times the total white blood cell count to get the absolute neutrophil count. So, for example, if the white count is 5,000 and there are 20% neutrophils, the absolute neutrophil count will be 1,000. Neutropenia is usually defined as an absolute neutrophil count below 1,500. But that's a statistical measure, not a medical one or a biological one. Generally, neutrophil counts in the range of 1,000 to 1,500 are statistically low but absolutely fine functionally. You don't need more than that. And in fact, anywhere between 500 and 1,000 is also low, and it may be important to find out why it's low, but defense against infection is perfectly normal. When the count gets below 500, then the risk of infection by bacteria and fungi starts to increase. Um, when it's below 200, that risk is very high. That is sometimes called agranulocytosis and it's very hard to go with that kind of count for very long without encountering a serious infection. However, um, there are two major causes of neutropenia. One, or I should say classes of neutropenia. One is due to lack of production, and the other is due to destruction. And the relationship, <coughs> excuse me, the relationship between the neutrophil count and symptoms depends on the mechanism. You might think of it this way. When neutrophils aren't being made, the ones that are in the blood are kind of old and tired, and they don't function too well. And that's when you see the most risk of infection. When they're being destroyed rapidly, the ones that are in the blood are very young, healthy, vigorous neutrophils just out of the bone marrow. And those are actually much better for a given number. So a patient with a neutrophil count of 200 due to lack of production is at much higher risk than someone with a neutrophil count even of 100 due to antibody-mediated destruction or some other destructive process. Now, chemotherapy stops the production 
of neutrophils. In fact, most of what we know about the risk of neutropenia actually comes from patients who've had chemotherapy. And not only do they have decreased production of neutrophils because of toxicity to the bone marrow, but they generally also have immune defects due to the chemotherapy and its effect on the rest of the immune system. So they are even more susceptible than someone with congenital or some form of pure neutropenia. There are a few drugs that lead to destruction of neutrophils, but those are quite unusual and rare. As I said before, you can classify them broadly as lack of production or increased destruction. Sure. And then you can also classify them as acquired or congenital. So the vast majority of cases of neutropenia are acquired and, in fact, transient. And it's due to either viral infection that suppresses the bone marrow and then it goes away, or to a drug which usually works by suppressing the marrow and then hopefully goes away. Congenital, obviously, one is born with. And then there's some more chronic forms of acquired neutropenia. So in the Severe Chronic Neutropenia International Registry, we work with patients who have severe congenital neutropenia, a, uh, a hereditary form of neutropenia, um, cyclic neutropenia, and a variety of congenital neutropenias associated with pediatric syndromes, um, immune deficiencies, and so forth. We also have patients with autoimmune neutropenia, which is a destructive process. In children, it generally is self-limited and goes away in a few years. In adults, it can be chronic. And then idiopathic neutropenia, which means we don't know what causes it. And it's more common in adults. And it may be increased destruction. It may be lack of production. Um, it varies from patient to patient. And we often don't know what the mechanism is in any individual. It's difficult. And there are several ways they can do it. One is by networking with other patients and families through the National Neutropenia Network. There's also a organization in Canada of uh, a neutropenia support group and some in Europe. Um, another way is to make sure that their physician um, gets expert opinion and advice from people who are familiar with neutropenia. There aren't very many, and nobody should expect his or her physician to know everything about it. But I often tell patients, never trust a doctor who doesn't want a second opinion. There are only two things that can happen when your physician gets a second opinion. One is, and they're both good, one is that you find out that he or she was doing the right thing, and the other is that you find out he or she was not doing the right thing, and it's corrected. So the Neutropenia Registry maintains a list of its board members and liaison physicians in the United States, Europe, and around the world who are very happy to consult either formally or informally on any patient. And I would urge families to make sure their physician either contacts one of us or some other local expert who's familiar with neutropenia. Well, to make the diagnosis of neutropenia, all you need is a low absolute neutrophil count. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but there are several caveats to that. One is, as I mentioned, most neutropenia is transient. So I would not make the diagnosis of chronic or severe neutropenia without at least three neutrophil counts, all below 500. And those should be spaced out at least over several weeks to find out if it's transient or not. In most, but not every case, a bone marrow examination is required to rule out leukemia or myelodysplasia, which are causes of neutropenia due to occupation or dysfunction of the bone marrow, and to determine whether the neutropenia is due to lack of production or to destruction. So the bone marrow both helps with the diagnosis and gives some insight into the mechanism. After that, there are a lot of very specialized tests that have to be tailored to the individual patient. And that's where the 
expertise of someone who's been working a lot with neutropenia comes into play. Because I can't give you a list of essential tests for everybody. Um, each patient is a little bit different. And as I mentioned, there are lots of different ways to get to the final problem of neutropenia. Um, we're all available to give advice or to help out with any patient at any time. Let me just see if there's anything else that I... Uh, another point I would make to patients and families is that the disease is very rare, but you're not alone. And so through support networks, it's possible to find others and get very helpful advice and support on practical aspects and psychological support that only others in the same condition can provide to you. One other point on the diagnostic tests, there's one disorder called cyclic neutropenia, which requires blood counts two to three times a week for up to six to eight weeks to make the diagnosis because the counts go up and down, as the name implies, in a cyclical pattern. And so a few blood counts are not enough to make that diagnosis.